Take it away, guys. Thank you. Uh, so hi, I'm Jane Lee. I'm actually um, here on behalf of Dr. Susan Rivers, who couldn't be with here with us today. Um, but I'm honored to represent I Thrive Games. I'm the Senior Director of uh, Operations and Mental Health. And I am here with the brilliant educators, uh, Matt Barber and Paul Darbasi. Do you guys want to quickly say hello? Hi, I'm uh, Matt Farber. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Northern Colorado. I'm in the School of Teacher Education. Uh, my name is Paul Darvazi. I teach media uh, and English at a high school in Toronto, Ontario called Royal St. George's College. And we are here today to share with you a curricular project we created to teach social emotional learning using an English language arts um, program and it was using a commercially uh, so a quick word about I Thrive. Uh, we are a nonprofit dedicated to preparing teens to thrive by meeting them where they are and working in partnership towards the world. Uh, we all have a voice, choice, and agency to reach their full human potential. And we do this using games and game design because we ascribe to the belief that play and games are foundational to the human experience, especially um, to the teenage years, but also throughout lifespan. We really focus on teens because the teen years are a period of nearly unmatched growth and potential, close to that of the first few years of life. Um, you have incredible speed, teens are absorbing new information at an astonishing rate. Uh, there's great opportunity, there's a lot of neuropsychological things that are happening at this time. Um, risk taking is embedded into this period of time um, and impact, you know, habits formed in the teen years last a lifetime. At I Thrive, for us, a thriving teen represents someone who has competencies, so they have skills, knowledge, and practice. Uh, they have agency, they feel they have a sense of influence over the world and their life path. And they have integrated identity, which is a sense of personal consistency across personal and social roles. And so we're committed to creating meaningful and authentic experiences for teens to prepare them to thrive. And so we wanted to create a fully embedded approach to social emotional learning. Um, through English language arts and using a game-based program. And we knew we needed experts to work with us, and that's why we pulled in Matt and Paul. And Paul's gonna tell you a little bit more about the curriculum. Okay, great. Uh, has anybody played What Remains of Edith Finch? Wonderful, it's gonna make my job a lot easier. Uh, has anybody played Gone Home? Gone Home, great. So, um, so we designed a unit, which we call the museum, uh, I'm not gonna get into why at this point, uh, around Edith Finch as a central text. And, and I think the idea here was to synthesize the aims and goals of a traditional high school English class um, with uh, a, a curriculum that also embedded social and emotional learning. Uh, and I'm gonna discuss why we did that shortly. So Edith Finch is an award-winning narrative game. Uh, it only takes about two and a half hours to work through the whole game, which is one of the reasons we decided to use it. Um, it, is, it, is, uh, it is extremely rich in terms of both its visual uh, its visual appeal, but also it has a great deal of narrative depth. And the, the, the story essentially is, you are a young woman who's returning to her family home on the coast of Oregon. And this home is it's, it's this huge architectural yard sale that it was built over a period of time. And she comes from an extremely eccentric family. And something very mysterious has led to the disappearance of everybody in her home. So the course of the game, you're moving through the house and examining objects and visiting rooms and re reading diary entries and all sorts of artifacts in order to put together the story of what has happened to your family. And it's an absolutely beautiful game. When you're playing through, um, the, the family tree materializes as you put together the story of each individual. If you haven't played it, I highly recommend it. So um, when we put this together, one of the, one of the reasons that we, we first of all chose this game, as an English teacher, of course, uh, I know that many of my colleagues in the English world would be very reluctant to bring a video game anywhere near their classroom. Um, this game offers a variety of opportunities for learning that I think are entirely consistent with any type of, of, of traditional high school English class. I mean, there's phenomenal character development. Uh, there's something called environmental storytelling at play uh, in this game, which has not necessarily been part of a traditional English curriculum, but certainly has a place there. Also a wonderful opportunity for genre study, because it falls into the realm of magic realism. Uh, so you can look at the, the features of the game that actually coincide with the magic realist tradition. Uh, and uh, in terms of identity, what's really fascinating about it is that when you're playing the game, you're enacting a form of social archaeology. 
because you're finding out about the, the, the intimate lives of each character through the objects and possessions that they have. And we leverage this feature of the game so that the students playing the game would then bring the personal objects and items from their own lives in order to use those as touchstones to discuss their own identities and the development of their identities. And it worked beautifully. And then finally, what's really interesting is when you introduce this type of text into the classroom, it's a multimodal text. That, you know, I, I, I'm a little skeptical of Gardner's sort of you know, uh, <laughs> different ways of learning, but, but definitely when you have audio, visual, textual, all of these things that play together, and in a, in a very engaging uh, format, you have a much greater chance of enlisting uh, students into the narrative, which gives you actually something to talk about. And one thing that's going on uh, you know, across the board in English classes in North America, probably Europe, is what's called fake reading. Right, the theater of pretending you read the book, and then the teacher pretends that you've read the book, and then you all talk about a book that you didn't read. Right? So, uh, so this, this definitely is an antidote uh, to that issue. So all of these elements, uh, both the game design element, the language, uh, the language arts element, and the social emotion learning element, synthesize very cohesively. And the importance of this uh, is paramount, because studies have shown over and over again that social and emotional health, a sense of well-being, a sense of self-confidence, is predictive of academic success. Right? If you don't feel good about your life or yourself and you're not feeling secure, it's very difficult to, to devote that mental real estate towards, towards learning. So, but schools don't make space for social and emotional learning. So the solution that we came up with is, let's try to get those lessons across aligned with a traditional curriculum. So that way we're not asking schools to make additional space. This is just sort of an overview of the project. It's 11 lessons uh, over a three-week unit. Uh, we piloted in a bunch of schools at different kind of socioeconomic and cultural settings. Uh, it offers that idea of synthesizing social and emotional learning with a traditional humanities class. And uh, it, it was created, uh, Matt and myself and a bunch of other people uh, worked on this together. We had somebody who specialized in universal design for learning. And the importance of that is not the game itself is not only accessible, but the curriculum offers a wide variety of options for the students to access the material and is therefore an accessible curriculum. And we work with somebody very closely in order to do this. Uh, and the final thing, the most important thing, is that it worked. I, I taught this with my students, and even I was involved in the design process, but I always have a healthy degree of skepticism about these things actually working, so we all should. And, the, and, and I measured, I thought the measure of success would be the level of emotional disclosure. But what I realized, that's not the measure of success. The measure of success in this project <laughs> is whether the students warped, uh, walked away from the project with the tools in order for them to invigorate their sense of identity and to feel empowered with the knowledge that they don't have to be who people have told them that they are and who they have convinced themselves that they are and to realize that there is the possibility of rewriting your own story. That was the most important message, and I think it got across. And the most fundamental success of this is I felt so close to my students. They felt close to me, and we opened up to each other in a way which is not, you know, I guess very common uh, in classrooms, and it depends on the situation, of course. So um, this is a wonderful video about its implementation uh, by uh, Brian Harmon at the Fayette County School in, uh, in Georgia, uh, which will give you a sense of the kind of emotional flavor of the implementation of this game. job of taking a story or a narrative and marrying it with uh, student interests and the things that, that are personal to them. What I like most about the gaming experience is how it has a deeper meaning to everyone's story. Not only are you putting yourself in the mind of a character that you might not have before, but you're going deeper and thinking, what does this person care about? I learned some pretty good Bible lessons about life, how people are different from each other. There's a character that's going through something. 
then I use that as a as a catapult to then guide them through the process of finding that out about themselves. What I learned about myself is I should start journaling more. I already like to write, but ever since we started playing the game, I started journaling again and taking it a little more seriously. We did a project where we put ourselves in the perspective of a couple of characters in the game, and we wrote down on postcards like a secret that they would have shared. A lot of the assignments that we do in the Museum of Me project are, are, are different. They're not conventional. I was kind of excited. I mean, like, you wouldn't think you would play video games in English class. It makes class more enjoyable. I was pretty excited because we're going to be involved with the game itself. It's just overall a lot more captivating than a book would be. I think when you hear video game, uh, you automatically assume it's this one thing. It's funny, when I introduced it, I said, yo, we're playing a video game, uh, you know, and it gets them all excited, but, and there was a lot of trepidation on my end. I was kind of fearful that students wouldn't like it, maybe some wouldn't understand it, but I, I loved the, their transformation and how they were making those connections and going back to being like, oh, that was, that was based on, oh, that's why they did that, and so you get those aha moments the teachers look for. I'm not a video gamer, but I liked it because there's multiple ways to play the game. There's multiple ways to get information each time you play the game during college. Remember that she's right. She went back to the house too, and this is us playing through and she's discovering those things. If we live forever, maybe we have time to understand things. But as it is, I think the best we can do is try to open our eyes. I've kind of changed the paradigm for, for video game playing. It's just, just entertainment. Now they're playing the game, but tethering it to something educationally sound. Video games is like that next step, that next, you know, breaking that fourth wall. Um, and so I saw the opportunity and, and, I, and I took it. Um, and it's been great. Some of the things that I would say to parents who, who feel a little uh, apprehensive or a little reticent about the idea of their child playing a video game in class is it's just a tool to be used um, in order to engage the students a little more. This game allowed for them to have a lot more interaction and a lot more agency in, in what they are consuming. I'm trying to get the students to build self-awareness, build self-esteem, and looking at things about themselves that they wouldn't typically look at or talk about in a traditional class setting. Most of the other English teachers will give us a book or a play and we just read it and it's very two-dimensional. This game, you got to walk around and see things that you wouldn't see before. You know, developers are making more and more games that have their finger on, on that pulse uh, of, of what's going on in society. And so I am so grateful for the Museum of Me curriculum. I saw a lot of growth in my students and it was the perfect thing to incorporate into an English uh, classroom in this day and age. Hello. I took some notes so I don't forget things. Normally I don't do that. And normally I'm, I know I'm the only one who knows I forget things. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we, uh, we started out with this idea that games are a uh, form of media, right? Uh, trying to get away from this concept that we should have games in classrooms because they're popular with kids, but rather that games are, uh, particularly narrative games, are a storytelling medium uh, some argue it's a storytelling medium of the 21st century. And uh, we, you know, to have an understanding of that, we need to teach that in schools. I mean, will we not teach documentary film or how propaganda posters work, those sorts of things in classrooms because they're newer? Um, you know, we need to teach this in all sorts of ways. So we started out by using this game as a core text, the same way we would teach with To Kill a Mockingbird or a Walden, right? Uh, it's a core text, right? Um, also, we design experiences, as Paul said, around the game that honor the game. So when you're building a museum, it's reflective of the game itself. And uh, more importantly, uh, we intentionally created this experience so we're not using the game as a teaching machine. Uh, we are using intentionally uh, constructionism in all of the lessons. 
Uh, we are not using the game as uh, a way that you play this game and you learn this. Play math game X and learn math concept X. We want to move beyond the fact, or the concept rather, that games are um, transactional or transmissive uh, and move towards this notion of games as being transformational to the learning experience. Uh, using a game as a text. In this case, constructionism, this is a concept from Seymour Papert, who uh, was at MIT, um, and his notion was that computers are not uh, teaching machines, but children learn by teaching the computer. Uh, and this concept undergirds project-based learning. Uh, the only exception in our unit about project-based learning that is different from most models of project-based learning is public audience. Uh, because it deals with identity and growth and social emotional learning experiences that may be very personal, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be you know, published on uh, you know, Twitter, let's say. You know, um, it may just be that Paul is the audience for his students, which is okay, right? So it's a, a flavor of project-based learning. But it certainly involves uh, creation and reflection along the way. Uh, so we took this idea around social emotional learning and that games are media. Games have unique affordances. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but games have unique affordances that lend themselves to social emotional learning. This is the uh, CASEL framework, which is a collaborative for academic social emotional learning, which is used in many, many schools. It's one of many different frameworks. It's, it, you can critique the framework also because it does seem to um, not really, uh, well, it doesn't seem to, but it doesn't mention any pro-social outcomes. Like you can check a box, your empathy, box check. Does it, you could have empathy for a villain though, right? Uh, you could have what's called selective empathy, you know? You could have more empathy for uh, Notre Dame burning than you can from people dying in war, right? You pick that empathy, right? So we look towards social, um, emotional, pro-social, rather, outcomes from here. And we do this by using the game as a text, not as a, um, a teaching machine. <coughs> so um, we also um, we also look towards um, teachers uh, to implement this. Uh, as Paul mentioned, there are successes. We, we don't have dashboards, right? To kill a mockingbird doesn't have a dashboard to know that you mastered what Harper Lee wants in the text, okay? We want to move past this idea of dashboards, and the game is the text, and you know the teacher is the dashboard. The teacher, just like in any other English language arts class, you know, we design lessons around books, right? So we're doing the same thing here, designing lessons around the game. And um, this is the website Post Secret. So this is an example. So. Uh, students play a part of the game, and then they look at their different identities, whether they have, like, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Instagram, right? Okay. I don't know if the, uh, the, I didn't stay for the entire keynote because we were preparing for this. I don't know if he mentioned Finsta also when he was talking about Instagram. No? Okay. So, you know, you have your real Instagram, and Finsta is like your fake Instagram that your parents don't follow, right? So it's a second identity, right? So we put this right into the game here. And um, this is a, a lesson where you go to this website, Post Secret, right? Or students take cards and they write their secrets on the cards and they do this anonymously, okay? And this has to do with certain parts of the game. I don't want to spoil it for anybody that didn't see it yet or play it yet. But um, I should say one more thing. Um, well, I'll just give it to Paul, due to time. <laughs> one more thing is Paul. Um, so, so one thing, I, I, we're very limited in terms of time. We only have 20 minutes. But one of, one of, I think one of the great successes of this has been the types of assessment that we created around, uh, around the game. Uh, and, and we would welcome your inquiries. If you want to know more about it, if you want to know what the types of assessments that we did, uh, that we even have examples of what students produced, I think it would be very valuable if you're in this space at all. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that this is going to be entirely available for free. And that we're also looking for teachers to pilot the project in their classrooms. So if there are teachers or administrators or anybody who is interested or curious about this, 
and you would be willing to implement it. We'll work with you in order to get this into your classroom and give you all of the support and all the materials that you would need in order to do that. So uh, we, we surveyed the students at the end of it, and we took some, and, and they were, I have to say, of, of all the surveys uh, in, in my classroom in particular, those are the ones that I read, everybody was very positive about the experience. We took some sort of uh, selections uh, from their feedback. This one says, the museum of me was awesome from the get-go. It allowed me to express myself in whatever way I wanted, since the guidelines were not strict and the creative flow was super present the entire time, due to the fact that the responsibility responsibility was entirely on me since I could make pretty much anything I wanted to a certain extent. A little bit of a run on <laughs> It made me explore different avenues of my life and gave me ideas and made me re uh, reminisce about what I had done previously. I learned more about myself and through my creative storytelling had a lot of fun as well. So that's, uh, that's a great kind of all-encompassing statement. Uh, I would describe this unit as challenging, yet very interesting and fun. Reflecting upon yourself and discussing social and emotional issues is seldom talked about in a social setting like school. Although I think once some of my other peers started opening up more and sharing experiences and things in their life that mattered to them, I felt comfortable with talking and reflecting upon myself. This unit allowed me to explore myself in further detail. Instead of serving as a class to explore my identity, I found more so that it provoked me to do further self-reflection outside 